Hello, everyone, and this is January 20th, 2022. This is our Crystal Ball 2022 video conference. So I'll be with you shortly. Just give me a moment. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Crystal Ball. Uh, we're going to be talking about real estate, real estate, real estate, stocks, bonds, crypto, gold, silver, cannabis, healthcare, utilities, malls, and office buildings today. Um, all things 2022, and I've done a deep data dive, so a lot of this is going to also include the data and statistics. I want to just reiterate that these are, you know, this is really the experts in those various asset classes talking about the things that will give them tailwinds and headwinds in their own industry. So what I'm doing, I'm not pretending to be the expert in each one of these areas, although I do have, you know, decades of experience in them. Um, they are the experts. They're the ones that are monitoring all of the things that would be a bonus and also a detriment. And I think it's just very helpful for you to see what the experts think of their industry. So let's start off with stocks. And um, I just did an interview earlier today with Lizanne Saunders. She is the managing director and also the chief investment strategist of Schwab. Schwab also owns um, TD Ameritrade. And um, so that was really revealing and I cannot wait. I'm hoping I can share the entire interview with you at minimum, I'll be um, pulling out the key data points for a blog at minimum, but hopefully the entire interview it was 50 minutes long and it is very informative. I will also show you some of the data points that we discussed today, which are publicly available on schwab.com. So let's go ahead and start with that. So some of the things that she and I were talking about today were some of the things that are included in this particular blog. And I'll go ahead and I'll give you guys, um, I'll put this into our chat and, you know, when I come back on. So one of the things that I think is really important is that you guys have heard from me about the CAPE ratio, which is basically a ratio of price earnings. And it's saying that stocks in short, are very expensive. This is another way of measuring how expensive or not that stocks are. It's called the Buffett indicator. And what he does is he takes market cap of stocks versus GDP. And as you can see, in this one, the price of equities looks even more crazy than the, the CAPE ratio. I'll show you the CAPE in just a moment. But basically, we're going back here to 1952. And uh, of course, this doesn't include the Great Depression, but the Great Depression would come in be, you know, a little bit lower than 2000 on this. So it's really important to realize that equities are very expensive. So here's the other indicator of that is this CAPE ratio. And again, when we were first talking about this CAPE ratio in 2019 before the pandemic and the, the downturn that was 38% drop in the S&P, um, you know, we were saying that it was, the stocks were the most expensive, so subject to you know, severe correction after dot-com, followed by the Great Depression, and then it was where we were. This was in 2019, you can see, there that that high in 2019 was actually a little bit lower than 1929. Now we're way above where it was in 1929. And again, if we're looking at the Buffett indicator, we're way above everything. So I think it's important for everybody to understand that stocks are very expensive, that the economy is going to slow down, that interest rates are going to go up. That isn't um, by and of, of itself, a negative thing in the 21st century. If yields were higher, like if, if you were being paid just to loan money instead of to have to own their stock, then you know there would be a lot more people that were interested in bonds. But bonds are a problem in and of themselves right now with interest rates stuck in this low interest rate environment. And as interest rates rise, because as you know, your existing bond becomes less valuable. It could actually become illiquid. It can lose money. Uh, as interest rates rise, there is going to be a happy point at some point where interest rates are high enough 
that you're actually going to get paid a decent dividend to take on the risk of a bond. Right now, if you own bonds, you're probably losing money. Statistically, you are. So that's important for you to realize. So we kind of lumping in stocks and bonds together. So what can stocks do in 2022? Well, what we think they're probably going to do is that they there's a lot of reasons why they could actually increase rather than go into a recession right away. First of all, it's really rare at the beginning of the rate hike cycle for a recession to occur. Um, but so, but it's definitely correlated with slowing down the economy. Now, what the Feds are going to try to negotiate is what they call a soft landing, and that means that you know, we can kind of tamper down right now, you know, when during the pandemic, there was money everywhere. It, you had to be practically, I mean, you could be anything but dead and you practically got money. So now they're saying, okay, you know, like a lot of small business owners don't qualify for additional stimulus. Um, the eviction moratoriums are gone. The student loans are still paused through May 1st, but most of the other government programs are what we call being sunset. So it's the end of them, right? And that means that money supply is getting tighter. Um, the feds are gonna stop buying their mortgage-backed securities. They're gonna stop buying treasuries. And in fact, they're gonna start selling their massive tranche of it. So the feds have $8.1 trillion on their balance sheets by a comparison model in the Great Recession. It was in 4 trillion and we were all astonished and appalled by that and how, how, how the heck are they gonna get that down? Well, now they've got even more to get down. So they are gonna start running off that, that excessive balance and start to increase rates. Um, there could be two rate hikes, there could be four rate hikes. They could start as early as June, they could start before that, but they are definitely expecting a rate hike at least by June. Um, what we've been told in the last meeting was that they wanted to, you know, start, get rid of all the asset purchases by March and then start the rate hikes in June. That could be sped up, however. So what does that mean for stocks in the bottom line? What we're seeing in stocks is what we call churn. So even though the S&P 500 was up 19% last year, a great deal, and it, this is not even like a small majority, a large percentage of those stocks saw very wild price swings. So it's not uncommon to see a 40% between the high and the low. Like if I just take a few examples, you can see that, um, let's say for instance, even Google. which is a trillion, almost a $2 trillion company. The difference between 1809, the 52 week low and 3000, the 52 week high is more like, you know, doubling almost, not quite. So about 80%. And you could go through um, stock after stock after stock, whether it's Moderna, same thing. Look at the difference there between 500 and 117. So what we're seeing more is churn is that we're seeing a, a stock that's you know really great, is increasing in value, is increasing in sales, is, has really strong profit margins, it's a healthy company, low debt, uh, a lot of cash, and it is still subject to these wild gyrations, even if like with Moderna, it's got a low PE, price earnings ratio. Uh, Google's is reasonable, it's not fantastic. So, um, in the, the ones that are even crazier are, you know, even more mood swings. So what we've discovered, um, which is, you know, been a lot true for the past, it's a 21st century phenomenon. There's a lot more traders in the market. There's a lot of people that are looking to take a quicker buck. So if you, and, you know, we've reinforced this in the retreats for decades now, if you take on an individual stock, then you have to adhere to more of a buy low, sell high. Liz Zahn Saunders in our conversation today had um, an aphorism that she's coining that I think is actually better. And she calls it um, add low, trim high. So she's reinforcing the idea that it's not all in or all out, right? You could have a company like Moderna that you love or that you like a lot or that you think is very valuable. And if you bought it at 150 and it goes up to 500, somewhere in that process, you could sell high or trim high 
And then when it goes back down, you can add low. The, the same thing is gonna be true of a lot of the cryptocurrencies as well, a lot of the meme stocks as well. So a lot of these stocks are in one hand, it's the institutionals like the hedge funds and especially the insurance companies that are seeking higher yield because they're so leveraged. Um, so it's the big money and it's also the meme stock young money. So both of these things are creating what we call churn or volatility in the price. If you're looking at something more in an index, then those returns kind of get offset. So, you know, Moderna going like this may crisscross with another company going like that and at, at opposite times. And so the overall average could still be a 19% gain. So again, if you're gonna take on individual stocks, you have to be prepared for the churn. And in terms of the index, um, you know, it's going to be less, a little bit less volatile, but obviously you don't have that tremendous upside that you're seeing if you're willing to take on the uh, Wall Street roller coaster in an individual stock. In general, I would say that because it's a midterm election year, because interest rates are getting hiked, because we had 19% last year um, because there's you know earnings are being reduced all these sort of things they kind of add up to slower growth which usually adds up to less returns so <coughs> we would expect that stocks this year may even be in the low single digits okay so again don't think all or nothing if you are worried about it then just overweight safe I'm going to pause for a second because I got a dry throat and I'm going to get some water. Just one sec. Okay, so we talked a little bit about bonds, but what I would say is that I still think that in terms of bonds, you want to keep the term short and the credit worthiness very high. So the higher the dividend, the higher the risk. Again, right now, what we have is interest rate risk and credit risk. Both of those things mean that if you are in bonds, you could lose money. And the safe side, honestly, is not supposed to be losing money, right? It's supposed to be a safe way to earn an income. So if you own bonds or bond funds, um, now that the feds are dialing back their support, it's really important. And the markets are still liquid. That doesn't mean that that will continue to be the case going forward. And again, as interest rates rise and you have this low interest rate bond, nobody's going to want to buy it from you. So now is the time to know what you own in your portfolio and to make sure that you are underweighted on bonds and that you have liquidity. Um, and we can, we can talk about that more in a personal session, but, um, and we also spend one full day on it in our investor educational retreats, what's safe, how to get safe, that sort of thing. What I say in general is that getting safe is a two-step process in today's world. The first thing is you gotta keep your money. So don't think I'm earning zero because you're gonna be vulnerable to someone selling you into something risky. In a world where the safe money earns zero, taking on two or 3% of a yield could mean that you are vulnerable to losing money. And that's not, um, you know, that's not really worth it. That's an opportunity cost as well, because then you won't be able to buy something great that pays you five or 6% in another year or two. So getting safe is a two-step process. Keep your money. And then you could consider safe income producing hard assets that you purchase for a good price and that can produce income in a post-pandemic world. Every word in that sentence matters. It's a very long sentence. But there are certain things that you could purchase that would actually are, are a good price and would um, definitely pay you a good income. So again, we talk. I talk about that a lot in the ABCs of money. We spend a full day on it at the retreat. So if you need to get updated on that sort of thing, there are resources for you. Let's talk about real estate. There was one chart that I think says a lot. You know all the things about real estate, like real estate prices are high and everybody wants to buy. But what we're seeing here in the uh, University of Michigan sentiment study is actually quite different. And I think it's very, very telling. So it's this chart. And again, um, you're gonna be able to see this on schwab.com. And it's one of Liz Ann Saunders. So if you look for Liz Ann Saunders, you can read her most recent commentary. This is one of her more recent articles. So this chart is a survey of consumer sentiment. They put together houses 
vehicles and large household durables. And as you can see, it has tanked. So this idea that everybody wants to buy and is going to keep buying, it's not what the forward-looking consumer sentiment surveys are showing. It's showing rather that the costs are prohibitive and what they're doing is they're actually taking buyers out of the market. Now, the other measure that would show you that is that 77% of counties in the United States are unaffordable. So not only are people having to spend a third of their income to purchase the house, that as interest rates rise, they're now no longer gonna qualify. The banks will not loan them the money. So if you are in worry, you know, wanting to buy a house and you'd like to buy low, I think you still have to be patient. So it never hurts to be a patient buyer and an opportunistic seller. And I'll go briefly out of housing and into office buildings and malls. Those of you that have been in the malls lately, you probably noticed that there's just not a lot of shopping going on and there's a lot of vacancies. If you've been to office buildings um, in, in uh, San Francisco, I was looking at the earnings call for Boston Properties, which is a big CRE. Um, developer in, in San Francisco, New York, Boston, a few other places, their vacancy or their occupancy in San Francisco is 18%. The highest occupancy they have is in Manhattan and it's still only about 50%. So these are, um, there could be a structural shift. A lot, look, millennials and Gen Z do not want to return to the office full time. Many of them have moved into the suburbs because the cities were not affordable. So a lot of these CRE building um, owners and you know, some of the companies that are invested in CREs, especially like banks, you'll hear them being very aggressive with their workforce. Like we're gonna force you to come back to the office. And then of course, recently they've dialed back that. There could be a structural shift here. And again, the feds printed up all this money and they mostly gave it to the biggest companies like the banks, like the malls, like the, you know, developers and that sort of thing. So they do have a lot of cash. They also have these long-term leases where the companies, they get egregious fees if they try to break their lease. So a lot of companies are trying to sublease and subleasing activity in these big cities um, are off the charts. So that doesn't portend well. So just be careful because here, especially in the REIT market, the higher the dividend, the higher the risk. And they're saying that they have high occupancy, especially the malls, not necessarily the office buildings. They're, they're being more truthful. The malls are saying higher occupancy than I'm seeing. And they, um, they also are benefiting a little bit from the leases that uh, companies have to pay unless they declare BK. So in general, I think housing um, may have hit its zenith. Also, one last thing that people are not factoring in this dramatic rise in the home prices is being heavily skewed up because there are bigger homes being sold. There aren't that many starter homes available. So we're seeing a great increase in intergenerational housing. So grandma, uh, mom, and you know, millennial son or daughter, or even couple, all three generations are sometimes coming together to buy one house. That house is more expensive. That skews the rates up, okay? So um, it's not that every single house, especially starter homes are worth you know, that much more this year than they were last year. It's more that the amount of sales at the higher end is skewing it up. Okay, so let's move on to crypto. Um, I think the big headline on crypto is that first off, Bitcoin was definitely the best performing asset in 2021 above oil, which was the second best performing asset. But both of them had massive amounts of dry rations, right? So the high for Bitcoin was like 65,000. Let's see where it is right now. And Coinbase is um, publicly traded. It's one of the larger crypto platforms. You can host a wallet here as well. So if we look at their prices, Sorry, right here. So Bitcoin is now at 40, Ethereum at three, 
Cardano at 127. These are really volatile. And what a lot of people are not that aware of is that, look, these are not necessarily being used to purchase things. There was a brief window where you could have bought a Tesla with your Bitcoin, but that's gone. I think that uh, Tesla just said you could buy certain products with your Dogecoin now. But in general, most people are using this to try to get rich quick. Now, there is a lot, especially the younger generation that are just holding it. And they think, oh, when the dollar becomes worthless, this will be the only thing. But um, the whales, the big money, the hedge funds, institutional funds, they are definitely buying and selling, buying low, selling high, and they are creating the volatility. Whenever we see a big tank, it's always the whales that have cashed in. And then those people that are holding it, they have to wait through that period. So what I would say is that adding low and trimming high is a better plan even for crypto, because then if you sell high, even if you keep a little bit in case it goes higher, if it does in fact tank, you have the liquidity and you have the fortitude, the emotional fortitude to be able to buy low. So some of these, especially the altcoins, one last thing I wanna say about crypto <clears throat> is that the Bitcoin and Ethereum are indeed energy hogs. So if you care about green, you have to start looking at some of the altcoins. So Cardano, so Solana <clears throat> and Doge, are lower energy. And the interesting thing about them is that Bitcoin is certainly off of its high of about 65,000, but Cardano's high was, I believe, closer to $3 and it's at 120. So here's a lower energy coin that's actually trading at a, at a more affordable or a more desirable price. So there was the high there around 285, probably even higher right there, 296. And Doge was much higher as well. I think it might've been even above 40 and it's closer to 17 right now. So again, you know, you want to have, if you're going to be involved in crypto, individual stocks, you have to be aware of the traders, the hedge funds, the institutional whales, and, um, and also meme stocks. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're better off with, you know, some sort of like index fund. And you can still get really targeted. You can still get hot. You could do a biotech, you could do a technology. I wouldn't recommend a cannabis or a crypto fund, however. And we can talk about that as we go along. But the long and the short of it is that there's a lot of leverage in financial services companies, mostly like insurance companies are really off the charts in the amount of leverage. They're actually being mentioned a lot in the financial stability reports by the Federal Reserve. So I'm concerned about annuities and money market funds, but you also need to be concerned about who is behind the fund that you're purchasing. So even there, you wanna keep the credit worthiness high. You wanna make sure that they have a high credit score. Uh, in our retreats, we've started sticking mostly with looking at iShares because it's owned by BlackRock, which is a uh, AAA, I mean, double A. I think it's an AA minus company. Let's move on to gold and silver. So I do have another chart to share with you. And it's this one. So gold will likely face two headwinds in 2022 interest rates and a potentially stronger dollar, but high persistent inflation would be positive for gold. Um, if the markets go down or when they become volatile, that becomes positive for gold. And then of course, if there's central bank, bank buying and jewelry, that could be positive for gold as well. So it kind of depends on which one of these, uh, the, the tailwinds or the headwinds are going to be a bigger story. So, <clears throat> We will keep on top of that. The bigger story in gold is that silver is a better purchase. So gold is definitely uh, lower than its all-time high, but it's about 20% lower. Silver is really down. So it's silver, especially like the Silver Trust, the SLB, it's trading at about $22 a share and the high was more like 47, 48. So I think that the better value in terms of being a better price is silver. And silver and gold typically run in tandem with one another. They are emotional purchases when people lose faith in stocks or lose faith in the dollar. 
Um, but this particular time, gold has had its run up and silver has not. So I think that if you wanted to have a little hedge there that silver might be a better bet. Let's talk a little bit about cannabis. So cannabis has been killed, but honestly what's happening with cannabis is what has happened with most stocks. And that is what we're calling churn. So a lot of these stocks, whether they're good or not, uh, certainly the stocks that are not as good are the ones that are gonna be the most vulnerable. But even stocks that are good, companies that have increased sales, that have a good prospect, a good outlook, they are still getting killed. And then at the other time they might shoot the move. So <clears throat> in cannabis, the big thing that we wanna look for is when will cannabis be decriminalized in the United States? We've already talked about how both the House and the Senate have bills that they are developing. Now, why hasn't it happened? Well, if you've read the headlines, you probably know why that hasn't happened because they're trying to get fiscal support. So they're trying to get the bill back better. Before that, they wanted the infrastructure plan. They needed to raise the debt ceiling. Now they're trying to get voting rights. So with the midterm elections coming up, it's unlikely unless they, the Democrats feel that it's gonna help their position in the polls, it's unlikely that you're gonna see it. So we're gonna to have to have this as a developing story. Um, the easiest way to kind of monitor that is just to keep track of what Chuck Schumer is saying about it because he's one of the sponsors of the bill or uh, I believe Cory Booker as well. So you know, just keep track of the people that are sponsoring this legislation. If you are owning you know, some of these cannabis companies and full disclosure, I own Tilray, which um, purchased Afria and also purchased Sweet Water Brewing. So I do believe in this company. Um, if you own this company, then you do have to be um, aware that it should be uh, on your stock app, right? In case it shoots the moon, because this is a meme stock. And its last time was like 10 times higher than it is now. It may be trading under $6 a share right now. And uh, when it shot the moon back in February of last year, it was 67. So again, it's not down due to the company being a bad company. It's down due to churn. Moderna, down due to churn. Although we do have to be aware of the fact that Moderna's profit margins are going to be eaten up more than they were saying past because of the new disclosure that some of the members of the NIH feel that they should have part of that patent. So that is something that's going to, um, you know, cut down on their earnings, but it's cutting down on massive earnings rather than, you know, gonna be a massive amount of it. So um, yeah, oh, healthcare and utilities. So Lizanne pointed out that she thought that healthcare was something that would outperform so if you were thinking about a hot and you're like, I don't know what's hot and you wanted to go with the chief investment strategist, then you might pick healthcare or biotech as one of your hot slices. She thought that utilities were overvalued. Now utilities are interesting. It's um, something that I added a very specific utility that we talk about a lot in my coaching sessions and also at the retreat, it's called National Grid. And that's because it also has the clean energy focus. So it's really active in promoting wind technology, anaerobic digestion, solar, that sort of thing. So um, that's the one that I've been and it's really been on fire. So these companies have done extremely well. They've acted like a growth stock, even though their earnings aren't growing that much and their revenue is not growing that much, but investors just love them. They do pay a really good dividend. So just as an example, let's take a real quick look at National Grid and full disclosure, I own it. So here's National Grid at $74 a share. And, um, you know, earlier this year, you could have bought it at 56. That's a pretty wide range for a, a utility. And having a utility with a 28 P price earnings ratio, that's very high. Utilities should usually have a lower price earnings ratio because they don't have massively increased uh, revenue growth. Typically, it's got a little bit of an increase in revenue growth. So um, the dividend on National Grid, go back to that real quickly is 
So that's not a, a bad way to, but again, if you're adding utilities as a hot, it may be overvalued and it may be time to trim high so that if it goes down, you can add low. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that takes us through my portion of this. So again, I want to just encourage you, if you do not know what you own, if you do not know if you're properly diversified, if you're worried about the current trend, which is weakness, we've seen a correction in the NASDAQ composite index. Earlier today, they thought it was coming out of correction territory, but oh, it slid back in towards the end of the day. So if you're worried about all of these things, again, the right answer isn't to jump in or jump out. Market timing does not work but it is to overweight safe. It is to trim high. It is to be properly diversified. If you own individual stocks and individual companies, then you do need to have more of an active hand in it. You need to have a stock app. You need to you know, monitor it. And you might even wanna use some limit sell orders to help you sell high. Um, and consider joining us at the Investor Educational Retreat. So. Let me show you a little bit about that. It's online, so you can join us from anywhere. It's going to be 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific. That's 11 to 7 Eastern. You can go to nataliepace.com. Just click on that banner ad, and it'll give you testimonials. It'll tell you the 15 things you're going to learn and do. It's going to give you um, you know, all, a lot of various information. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, it's about budgeting or I know this or I know that. Um, the truth is this is a time proven 21st century plan. It earned gains in the dot-com and the great recession. It's as outperformed the bull markets in between. It's easy as a pie chart and it is a buy low, sell high plan on autopilot, but you must be rebalancing. Not just once a year, we have been encouraging people to rebalance more like three times a year. And again, if you have individual companies in there strategically, you have to look at those more as with a trader's eye. Okay, I'm gonna stop it there, but I will go ahead and open it up after we uh, stop the recording so that you can ask a question or two. We don't have a lot of time in today's call, but I will take one or two questions in just a moment. So again, those of you that are interested in the retreat or interested in joining the video conferences or have questions, we may already have a blog written about it. I may want to write a blog about it. Your best resource is always info at nataliepace.com and put in the subject line exactly what you're interested in so we can get it to the right person. Also, do, if you ever see a mass email, don't just hit reply. That's a uh, no reply email. We don't monitor that. It's just for our mass emails. So you do have to email info at nataliepace.com or call 310-430-2397. I will say it's much faster if you do email. And um, you also do follow me on social because I do daily money tips with links to longer information, data resources, other, what other people are saying, my blog, that sort of thing. I usually post that on Twitter. There's actually a Twitter feed on nataliepace.com. So you do not have to join Twitter to have access to it. Just go to nataliepace.com and you see my most recent tweets. If you haven't taken the investor IQ test, then just click to take it. And um, you can also scroll down to see other things that I've written recently. Real estate risks is something if you own real estate or purchase recently or have somebody that's that you know and love that wants to. Uh, we also talked about rebalancing. So lots of things here. And again, you don't have to join Twitter to see that, see what it is that I'm talking about. Go to nataliepace.com and you can see all of the various social media. It's a click away. Even watching this video conference back, just click on YouTube and you'll be able to do that. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it there. Thanks for joining me. And I really appreciate you being here. Again, it's Natalie Pace and nataliepace.com, info at nataliepace.com.